to be part two of the viaduct build on canal sidings. As you can see, um, I've now built two of the buttresses that go either side of the bridges and I've set the correct position for the girder on this bridge. What I've got to do now is build about another dozen buttresses and they're all made of plasticard so we'll get on with that now. Okay here we have the parts to make about a dozen more buttresses um, and they're built rather like this. So we have Oops, get it right way round. We have three pieces of two millimeter plastic card sandwiched together, this forming the bottom part of the buttress and this forming the wide part which is at the top. They are then covered with these pieces of brick uh, brick plastic card um, and then the plastic card is trimmed afterwards. So I'll put one together and you can see what it looks like. Okay, well I've been working on these buttresses for a couple of days now. The whole process takes a lot longer than you think because you actually have to wait for the solvent to set so that this embossed plastic card is really well stuck on here in order that you can trim it with your knife without giving yourself too many problems. You can also only stick this side on first and then trim it because if you try to put both sides on you can't get in there to trim it properly. So I don't advise trying both sides at once. Having got those dry you can then trim them as I have this one. That's just a knife down both sides, cut right through the um, plastic card and you're ready to fit the other side. We then end up a little later with both sides fitted and we can then fit the front face and the rear face. Um, and these still have to have the rear face trimmed. Um, here's one that is actually fully complete and you can sort of see, I'm not sure you can pick it out very well, the way that the scraping has produced a little bit of brick pattern on the edges of the butt joints. It's very difficult to see, I can hardly see it, but apparently it will show up better once it's painted. Time will tell on that one. But now that one is finished. The thing to ensure is that you get the tops as square as you can so that when you fit the capping stones those capping stones will look right sat on the top and then finally we can fit them onto the finished viaduct and then basically we have a few more little finishing touches of making the parapet walls and putting a ledge in along here and the edge of the topping of the um, viaduct and then we can start the painting job. So when I've done a bit more of that and got all the buttresses fitted we'll come back. Okay everyone I'm back again. Um, unfortunately this is turning out to be a much longer job than I thought and I still haven't finished. Um, I have managed to get all the buttresses but one built now and fitted and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but first of all I want to show you the detail of the parapet walls and what goes underneath them. Um, and here is a piece of parapet wall and underneath it is a piece of 1.5mm by 2mm plastruct strip which I've scribed in the vertical direction to represent the edge of the slabs or stones, however it's done, that top the viaduct. Um, and I'll show you how I scribed those. This is the setup that I used for scribing the 
deck edging material which is actually 1.5 by 2 millimeter strip material three pieces of which are sat in here now there are two sacrificial pieces of plastic card taped down to the bench to clamp them so that, to clamp the strips so they don't move there's a ruler clamped on here so that you can mark off the positions that you wish to have the edges of the stones scribed and I use another ruler which I run along the edge of that one so that I can then use my alpha cutter to simply make the scribe marks by pulling this way, move five millimetres, pull this way. When you've done that much of the strips you slide the strips through and carry on from there. Okay, and underneath that piece of plastruct, which I've just shown you how to scribe, is another piece of plastic, which is also a piece of plastruct, um, which is half a millimetre by three millimetres, and that's got three courses of bricks on it to represent, in scale scene speak, the ledge. Okay, here's a longer shot showing the whole viaduct. And as you can see, all the buttresses are done. Apart from here, I thought I'd get away without putting one, but I don't think I can manage to get away without it, so I'm going to have to make yet another buttress. Um, I'll go away and finish that off, and that will be for the next video. And finally, I've been asked by Pete at Pete's Hobbies Room channel, um, for a bit more information about something that I didn't mention in the video on the control system and that is the sector plate. Now the sector plate falls into two parts. There's its drive mechanism and what moves it and there's also the cameras that show the operator where it actually is. And they are two completely separate and independent things so I'll show them as two pieces of video. What we're looking at now is the underside of the sector plate and the actual sector plate is at the moment sitting here. This is the sector plate and it's connected to a shaft which goes back to the motor up here. Now that shaft, this part of it, is an M4 threaded rod which runs in an M4 nut which is soldered to a Meccano collar. The Meccano collar where it would normally have its grub screws to hold itself onto the shaft has no grub screws but here there is a Meccano bolt which is solidly fixed to the end of the sector plate and the collar is screwed onto the end of that bolt as far as it can go but not far enough so that the end of the bolt hits the, uh, the um, threaded rod. So the threaded rod is allowed to turn in the nut and that causes the table to move this way or that way depending upon which way the threaded rod turns. The threaded rod as we said is driven by this motor. It's a motor and gearbox combination um, and it comes from Expo Tools. It's a bit loud, a bit rough and ready but it does the job. The output shaft is connected via a universal joint which is another Meccano part to a Meccano shaft which has then got a Meccano coupler on it that connects it to the threaded rod. So as the motor turns, so the sector plate moves. The gearbox is adjustable in, um, in its ratio. I can't remember what the ratio I've used is. I just played about with it until I got the best compromise between speed of motor against speed of movement of sector plate and noise. I didn't want the motor making any more noise than it I had to have it. However, it is a pretty noisy motor, as I say, rough and ready. 
Anyway, the motor um, is driven by another piece of electronics, which is this, which is a um, board which I had to build myself, but it is also controlled via C bus. And this cable up here runs through here and into this module, which you can hardly see, but it's another C bus output module. The CBUS output module provides three signals to this board. Um, it provides one which controls the speed, whether it's fast or slow. It provides another one which turns the motor power on and off by operating this relay. And the third one changes this relay to choose the direction that the motor turns in. Th this heatsink here contains an adjustable voltage regulator. Um, and I have it set up to produce me two voltages, one at about three volts, the other at about one and a half volts. Um, and the switch between them is done by this transistor, which simply shorts out part of the resistor speed controlling section. Um, it's an LM3117 as I remember it, so if you want more information, look it up on its data sheet. Um, and the three signals from the CAN bus board allow me to have either of two speeds, either of two directions and on-off control. That simple really. The sector plate is pivoted over there. Why can I never see it? Oh there it is, it's down there. <laughs> There's the sector plate pivot. Um, and that is also another Meccano bush with a bolt going through it, um, which I'm sure will never wear out due to the fact that the, turn the, the sector plate moves such a short distance and very slowly. OK, we'll go on now to the cameras. The cameras are on a completely separate piece of circuitry, which comes from down here, a 9 volt supply, and that 9 volt supply goes all the way along to here and then goes up to the top of the uh, baseboard. The only other thing down here that we can see is this wire which goes to a 5 pin connector with a shield as well which is actually the monitor connection. So remembering that that is 5 pin I'll drop the board down and we can have a look at how the monitor works. This is the monitor that I use. Um, I seem to remember it came from Amazon. It cost about 24 quid. Um, I think I've now seen them on there for as little as 19. Um, it has this cable coming out of it with this strange looking connector on the end and supplied with it is another cable which if you plug the two in, in my case the monitor comes on. And I use this switch here to switch between the two video inputs, which are two of my cameras. This cable from the monitor, sorry, this cable, that is the one that goes round the back, is the one that I cut so that I could put in a five pin plug and socket, five pin in, um, to use to make an easy connection to the layout and we'll see where the other end of that cable is in a moment. So here we have one of the cameras. They're quite small, nice metal case and a bracket for mounting them. Mine are mounted through that hole so that I can swing them about to look at exactly the point on the track that I need to see. The other nice thing about these is that this rotates to allow you to focus the camera on whatever you're trying to see, which is always handy. It also has two rows of three infrared LEDs. I don't use these and I cover them up with pieces of tape. And the reason is that they produce a very strange light. Um, and if you've got a little bit of light around the camera, it's pretty good at picking up what you're looking at anyway. 
so I don't bother with them. The wiring on the camera is these three. We have the red one, which is for power. It's an ordinary barrel type connector. The yellow one is a phono socket for video and the white one is a phono socket for audio. I don't use the audio. The black cable from the monitor, having gone through the 5 pin DIN plug and socket, comes up here and this is its normal end where the manufacturers split out all of the cores for us. It has two black wires which are coaxial that go one to this and here one here to this um, phono connector which are the two input channels for your video. It has a red and a black which you can just about see here which I've connected to my red and black 9 volt supply. This monitor will run off 9 volts so I can use the same supply for the monitor and for the cameras. And there was also a blue wire coming out of there which is an automatic way you put it to 0 volts or 12 volts to switch between the two video channels. I don't use that um, so I just cut it short. Um, so I took the red and the black wire and connected them to my 9 volt supply and at the same time I have two more wires connected to the 9 volt supply. This one here which is a mating connector for that power and another corresponding one over here that you can't see for the other camera. The yellow wires simply connect to the yellow wires out of the cameras and that is a perfectly good working two channel camera system. Unfortunately as I pointed out I needed a third camera and for that I have a third camera ready to mount here as we saw. But I haven't wired it yet. But I need to get from this yellow wire into one of these two. So I'm going to choose this one which is next to camera number one and this will be called camera number two and the other one will be three and I'm going to put a relay in between this wire and these two so that depending upon the state of the relay this gets the signal from either that camera or that camera. That relay is going to be driven by a couple more wires now that have got to come up here from one of my CAN bus boards um, and that's the one that also drives the monitor that, the, that also drives the sector plate motor um, and it will drive that relay directly. The relay will be another one of those little blue ones that you saw on my little board underneath. Um, and then there'll be a switch on the control panel that allows me to select which monitor is on this channel, sorry, which camera is on this channel, and this one will always be on the other channel, and I'll use the switch on the monitor to switch between the cameras. So I'll have two camera switches. Not ideal, but perfectly workable. I'll be able to pick any one of the three cameras and be able to see what I'm doing. So that, in essence, is the way that my cameras are wired up. If you need any more information, then ask me a question or ask me for more explanations. OK, everybody, that's all for this update. Um, it's probably going to be a long time before my next update because, uh, as of tomorrow, I shall have another commitment for most of the month bit of a football fan and I shall be watching as many games as I can on the European tournament. Um, but hopefully my next post will be in the next month and will show the construction of the viaduct finished um, and then we can start adding some paint. So if you like the video don't forget to subscribe. If you want any, any more information leave me a comment, give me a like if you like it and Thanks for watching. Goodbye everybody.